Hi, and welcome back to Seal of the Living God Ministry. My name is Benny. Thank you for joining us today. If this is the first time you're joining this Bible study, I wanted to let you know that this is a ministry that is dedicated to studying the Word of God. So this is a Bible-based Bible study ministry, in other words. And what we've been doing over the last few studies is we've been looking at the verses leading up to the description of Jesus' second coming found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. And right before those verses that speaks of Jesus' second coming, there is a message broken up by three separate angels, and that is a last message that's being preached shortly before the second coming of Jesus. So far, we've studied Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, which is known as the first angel, and we've been starting reading the um, second angel, which is found in Revelation verse 8. So what we will do today is we will pick up where we left off and we will continue using the definition of terms uh, approach, which is looking at key words in a verse and having a better understanding of what those verses are saying so that we can have a fuller picture of what the message is trying to describe to us. So as we always do, we're going to open up in prayer. Beloved Father in God, holy, holy, holy is thy glorious and precious name. Thank you, Father, so much for your mercy and grace towards me and my household. And I pray, Lord, that you bless those who are watching this study and bless me also, Lord, as we study your word. Please fill us with your spirit and give us understanding, not based on what man has to say, but what thus saith the Lord says. Be with us today and always, and we thank you. In Jesus' holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen. So just as a recap, last time we were looking at Revelation 14, and we were looking at verse 8, and we were studying about Babylon, and I'm going to get into the details of Babylon, but if you haven't seen that video or any of the other videos prior to this one, I will put the description down below of those links, and I would recommend you watch those before watching these, because they're all building one on top of the other. Um, but one thing I did want to do is, just as a reminder, go over who Babylon is, and the aliases that also represent this uh, power, which is known as Babylon. So I'm going to put it up on the screen now. As you can see, Babylon is also known as the beast. It is also known as the harlot. It is known as the son of perdition, as well as the man of sin, the antichrist, and the little horn. And all these aliases all represent one power, which is the rebellious agency that Satan works through. And again, as a reminder, I don't say this uh, in any prideful way. I'm just being sincere in what the Bible has shown me. And I believe if you prayerfully and carefully study it, you would see it as well, is that this beast power is speaking none other than the Roman, Roman Catholic system. Um, not the parishioners, not the members that are ignorant and innocent and don't understand. Um, this is specifically speaking about the Roman Catholic system and its leaders led out by the succession of popes through all the ages. Um, and again, I do say that with all sincerity, but if you have not studied it out, please study it out. Look at some of the videos I have, one of them um, speaking about the beast power, and you'll see very clearly that the Bible teaches this. And all the Protestants um, up until now, not so much present day because they've lost their understanding of history, but all the Protestants clearly understood that this beast power what is and was the Roman Catholic system. Keep in mind that the devil has a counterfeit for everything. So just as we studied last time in Revelation 12, there is a pure woman spoken of, which is God's true church. And this Babylon, also described in Revelation 17, is a harlot. And this is a counterfeit of the true. This is a counterfeit that Satan has to deceive the majority of people. So again, if you have not seen that study, I would strongly recommend you study that before you get into this study. Um, but what we will do is let's read verse 8 again of Revelation 14, just to be reminded of the verse, and then we'll look at a couple key verses today. Amen? It says there, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on the words fallen, fallen, and we'll also look at the word wine. And we'll spend more time on the word wine and its application, but we'll look at the word fallen, fallen very quickly now. Let's look at the key word fallen in the Greek and see what definitions can be used for this word. My study shows that it, it can be uh, expressed as to descend from a higher place to a lower place. Another definition can be to be thrust down. 
It can also be used to fall out, perish, fall into ruin. Also, it can be used metaphorically to fall under judgment, came under condemnation. It could also be defined as to be cast down from a state of prosperity. And it could also mean to lose authority, no longer have force. So when I was studying out this message, I wanted to look at what this word meant in other verses to see what the application was. And that's a good tool, I think, for any Bible uh, person that's studying the Bible is to look at the original word and then see how it's used in different areas of the Bible. Specifically here, we're in the New Testament, so in the New Testament. So what I want to do is I want to look at the book of James, chapter 5, verse 12, which uses the same word. And I believe this is the application that's being used in the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 8. It says here, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Let me repeat that one more time. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. So when considering James chapter 5 verse 12, we see that this falling or fall, it says here, is applying to a condemnation or judgment. And I believe that is the application that God is trying to share with us in Revelation 14 8, when speaking about Babylon falling, falling, uh, it is a falling into judgment. So these are the three I want to highlight in speaking about Babylon. And again, Babylon is the Roman Catholic system led out by the successive leaders of popes teaching false doctrines which are unbiblical. And the fallen aspect is the following, that Babylon is falling into judgment, condemnation. Babylon is being cast down from a state of prosperity. And Babylon is losing its authority. So getting back to Revelation 14, verse 8, now that we've touched on falling, and again, we're seeing a condemnation or a judgment aspect, I want to spend more time speaking about this wine. And I'll be transparent with you. When I was studying this out for myself, because I felt that there was uh, a great importance for me to understand this message before Jesus' second coming, because it's got to be a powerful message if Jesus is going to come thereafter, after these messages have reached their fulfillment. And I was challenged or struggling with this this wine that's being spoken of um, that Babylon uh, uses, which leads to a wrath that God's going to pour out. Uh, I was challenged by that, and I was praying about it and, and wrestling with the Lord for quite some time, maybe weeks or months possibly. And eventually, uh, I feel the Lord woke me up one night, in the middle of the night, and He gave me an understanding of what this uh, wine that comes from Babylon, what is it representing? And what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, Matthew chapter 9, verses 16 and 17, to have uh, this understanding being revealed through an object lesson that the Lord provides. So we're in Matthew chapter 9, we're going to read verse 16 and 17. It says, No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put in to fill up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. And I'm going to read this one more time again, just to try to paint the picture for us in preparation for what we're going to discuss. It says in verse 16, No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. So in reading this, some of the background that's taking place is, first of all, a few verses before this, Jesus goes to uh, have dinner with Matthew, a publican, and sinners and the Pharisees question Jesus and his disciples why is it that your master is feasting with sinners and publicans and then thereafter the disciples of John asked Jesus why is it that your disciples do not fast as we 
and the Pharisees fast. So this is a situation where Jesus is, as he typically does, is revealing truth to them, which may not be something that they're aware of. And uh, they're asking questions to Jesus. And Jesus uses this object lesson, which we're going to use now, not necessarily to talk about garments or patches or old wine um, or, or new wine and bottles. It's, it, the application is not the necessarily the, the literal things that he's talking about. He's using those literal things so that we can understand the spiritual aspect of what he wants to express. So as we go through this, again, I want you to look at not just the literal, but use the literal to understand the practical. Amen? Since Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the disciples of John, people who are asking questions, we realize that Jesus would always speak truth to people, but there were those who would accept the truth and there were those who would not accept the truth. So I'm not here to tell you who would or would not based on the crowd that was there. We don't know the exact individuals, but we know that there were people that were questioning and some ended up receiving the truth of Christ and accepting it and others rejected it. So in understanding that, let's see how these people fit into this object lesson. And then once we know who the people are that are being spoken of, then we can uh, ap apply what was being added to those people. And then we can figure out what exactly Jesus was trying to teach here. So it says here again, no man puts a piece of new cloth onto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up, take it from the garment, and the rent is made worse. So let's just think practically. If I had a brand new shirt, or brand new cloth, let's say, and I have a raggedy old shirt that's falling apart, and I said, well, I'm going to fix this shirt, I'm going to take some of this new cloth, cut it out to size, and I'm going to try to stitch it to this old shirt, this old garment. And just thinking practically, if you try doing that, even though the, the cloth that's being added is new, it's being added to something that it's already defiled, something that is broken. And because of that, it won't be able to fix itself to it in a firm way. So keep that in the back of your mind as we continue now. So there's something new being added to something that's old or existing, and the old piece will not be able to hold on to the new piece because it's not in a condition to hold, that's a good word. It's not in a condition to receive that which was new. Amen? So again, keep that in mind. I hope you're getting excited as I am here. Verse 17 says now, Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. So remember, first we had a new patch and an old shirt or an old garment. Now we have new wine in an old bottle. So new, new, old, old. So there's a parallel here, right? And he continues saying, Else the bottles break, so these bottles will break, and the wine runs out and the bottles perish. So let's just stop there. So if you were in, in times of iniquity, the antiquity, excuse me, there were um, uh, bottles made out of, you know, let's say lamb or whatever, and they tied up the, the bottles and they would use it to preserve their, their drinks, right? Or their grape juice, their wine. Wine is just unfermented grape juice. And they would put that in there. But if you had an old wine, which is old and leathery and cracked and falling apart, and you put wine in there or new wine, what would happen is that wine would start expanding and that leather, uh, it's not prepared to expand along with the wine. And because of that, the bottles break, as Jesus describes, and it perishes. What Jesus is doing here is that he's explaining to these people, asking these questions who don't understand the truth that he's been preaching, that they are the old garment. They are the old bottles. Let me repeat that again. The object lesson is to let them know, the people, by using a practical lesson, an old garment and an old wineskin that's torn out and in bad shape, that that's their condition and something new cannot be added. And what Jesus is talking about, this newness that's being added in the patch and in the wine, and we're gonna focus more on the wine, is that the teachings of Jesus are, is that new substance that's being added to that which is old. And why is that important? Because Jesus was teaching them new things to them, but those things were not necessarily new. In other words, that new wine or that new patch that was being added on was not new in the sense of being new to God. It was always truth from God. That truth has always existed. It is everlasting truth. It was new to them because they had received false teachings, man-made teachings, and it was new to them because they were not aware of the truth that God had. So if we continue reading, it says here, 
and the bottles perish, uh, and the bottles perish, excuse me, and it continues to, but, now we're going to transition, they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. So Jesus is saying that in order for you and I, or these people, the disciples of John and the Pharisees, to be preserved, that they needed a newness, right? We need to be what? We need to be born again. We need to be receptacles for God, that God may able to be able to provide for us something new to us, even though it is not new to God, it is new to us, but it's eternal to God, because God's truth is eternal as He is eternal. So, what I'm trying to say is that the Pharisees and the disciples, they were the old bottles. The teachings of Christ that He was trying to impart or to fill them with, right? Because when Jesus teaches us, He's trying to fill us with His truth. But if we stay in our old condition, our, uh, we, if we're not converted and born again, as Jesus says in, to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, then we cannot receive the new wine because it will perish within us. We need, first of all, to be made new. We need to become new bottles. And then the teachings of Christ, which is symbolized in that new patch, and more specifically in the wine, then we can receive that new wine or those teachings which are new to you and I. And just thinking about that, the, let's look at the opposite to see if the application is true. If the new wine are the pure, undefiled teachings of Christ Jesus, then the old wine, the wine that perisheth, that wine must be not the truths of Christ. That must be man-made truths, quote-unquote, man-made traditions, which are not biblically sound, which are not from God. So Jesus is saying, eliminate those man-made teachings you have and re replace them, but prize to replacing them, you need to be what? born again, because you need to be able to receive that which I want to give you. And once you are born again, and you're receptive of spiritual gifts, I will pour out my teachings in you, and you will not only be able to um, consume them or obtain them, but you will be able to preserve them. Amen? I hope that makes sense to you. So again, we are bottles. We need to become new bottles in order to be able to receive the teachings which are new to us because we have been taught wrong teachings. Let me keep expressing that. Our teachings, if not found in God's scripture, are wrong. They are old or uh, defiled. They are corrupted wine which Christ doesn't want to give us. He wants to give us pure wine, undefiled wine, teachings which come from God and God Himself. But we ourselves have to be transformed in order to receive it. So with that understanding, let's jump back to Revelation 14 8 and look at the, the rest of what that wine does, that wine of Babylon. So we're in Revelation 14 verse 8. Let's read it one more time. It says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And we know that means judgment. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine. And we just found out the wine are teachings. And the question is, do we, we have the, the bottles, are we the bottles that Christ desires us to be, which are new bottles, new creatures to receive His teachings? Or are we that old corrupt bottle that is receiving this kind of wine, the false teachings of Babylon, the truths of man, which are not biblical, man-made truths are falsehoods. They're not, they have of no value in God's eyes. So he says, that they drink of the wine, but look what comes of it, the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Meaning, when we take or partake of false teachings, which are man-made traditions and commandments, and we try to take those in place of the truth which God has given us, the end result is that we will receive the wine of her fornication. Fornication is illicit sexual relations. So when we are having illicit relationships, with this false system of worship, and again, that beast power Babylon, and again, I don't say this about the members, I'm talking about the system, is the Roman Catholic system, led out by its leaders, the successive popes, 
teaching false doctrines. So when we accept those false doctrines, whether it come through Catholicism or whether they have permeated Protestantism, which they have, and we accept them, we are consuming the wine of Babylon, and that wine leads to wrath, leads to destruction. So I hope and pray, brothers and sisters, that this study has made sense to you. If this is the first time you've seen these videos and you are not aware of the channel, I pray that you may consider subscribing to the channel. I also pray that you may like the video if you're so impressed to, and if so much so, I would encourage you to share the teachings with others, whether you speak it and do a Bible study like the way we're doing now, or you follow uh, forward the video to somebody as you, as you are impressed to. At the end of the day, this is not my truth. This is the Lord's truth. So I pray that you may be a vessel for the Lord and that I may be a vessel also. Let's close out in prayer. Our Father and our God, and holy and glorious is your name, Lord. I know that we come to you, Lord, as those old wineskins, Father, um, being very hard, Lord, not willing to move, but being stuck because we are stuck in our ways. But you desire us, Lord, to become new wine bottles, um, that we may be able to receive that new wine, that pure wine, that undefiled wine, which represents your pure teachings, Father, those which come from your word and from God himself, because you are God. I pray that this uh, study was challenging for anyone, Lord, that you give them peace and comfort, comfort Lord, and do you lead them, Lord, to your truth. Um, I pray, Lord, that you bless each one of us, Lord, with your salvation, which comes through your Son and our God, Jesus Christ. Be with us, Father, and give us an opportunity to study again in the future, and may you be exalted. I thank you, Father, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you once more for joining us. I hope this was a blessing to you. God be with you, and we'll see each other next time.